Howdy, I'm Pat Gunn, and this is my March uh, vlog. So, since the um, since the last time I did this, about a month ago, it looks like uh, coronavirus has moved from being something that we were vaguely aware of, and we weren't really sure how far it was going to go, into something that's become quite serious, and there have been a lot of deaths across the world, and some countries are now um, seeing travel restrictions as people attempt to uh, prevent uh, the outbreak. And we know, as we probably knew before, that the people who are most likely to die are very old. But it can still make a lot of people very sick, and a lot of us uh, have loved ones uh, who are uh, fairly old. Beyond that, it's... Uh, there are concerns with it hitting certain industries and professions much heavier than others. Um, we've seen some uh, people in uh, various governments across the world uh, die who often tend to run on the older side and maybe they shouldn't be maybe they shouldn't be uh, so much on the older side. It's, it's a, probably not a great sign that we tend to uh, like the whole world has a problem of having people in office who probably should be retired. Um, but nonetheless, uh, that's the case. It's also very concerning for academia where you end up having a lot of older professors who um, who are at risk. And also academes, we tend to travel more often than most people do, just like tech workers. Uh, but unlike tech workers who tend to run pretty young, um, academes run pretty old. And uh, but there are there are various professions. It, it's 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 much more serious. It's much more obviously serious now than it was a month ago. Uh, and um, and I, I know some people who are dealing with the the uh, quarantine. Uh, a lot of the time it's employers who are have their own um, uh, don't come to work f uh, for two weeks after you travel um, but it's it's not just governments that are doing that and it's 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 sensible to want to limit the spread there's a question now for any country that has it in sufficient numbers whether it's even possible to still contain this and I I wonder if the, uh, if it's already too late um, it's particularly hard to control people uh, a lot of the time people have delusions about their health they think well that may seem like a sensible rule but I, I don't want to abide by it and so they won't and it's very hard to actually have effective quarantine that depends on uh, on being able to deal with a potentially hostile um, hostile people who you'd like to quarantine. There's there are a few things that this is reminding us about our societies. Um, right now, the lack of public health care in the United States means that there's a pretty strong financial disincentive, except in the few cities that have taken steps to directly address this. There's the concern that people who might, who you really would like to have check in with a medical provider, they might not have insurance. And so just like with any, uh, with any medical, uh, medical procedure, uh, and any time they check in, they risk bankruptcy just because it's so expensive to get medical care in the United States. And for a long time, people have been suffering this, but during an uh, epidemic, it's particularly dangerous uh, as a societal trait. There's the other issue that, um, that uh, the homeless in general, they are not on our radar for much of anything uh, in society. Unfortunately, we tend to approach uh, the homeless through a, a civil rights lens and we're reluctant to um, put them on the right path or, uh, or 
do anything particularly paternalistic. And that means that if if they start to get uh, sick, they could very easily get a lot of other people sick. And it's very unlikely, because they're already off the radar, for them to ever uh, stop being a, a vector until they're... Um, until they're uh, until they recover, assuming that they they uh, they could recover, because very often they have health problems relating to being homeless. Um, it's a, it's a bad time to uh, for uh, for American society in particular, just because it's exposing a lot of our long-standing weaknesses. That it would be great if we were to fix them, um, but I I don't know if if that's ever going to happen. I've, I'm, I'm a little frustrated as, as well that right now there's, there are at least some, um, some people who have expressed delight at uh, somebody who went to CPAC, the Cons Conservative Political, uh, Political Action Committee, um, and, uh, who, uh, who had uh, coronavirus and like CPAC, to be clear, it's a pretty crazy place. Uh, it you get the you get views that really should be fringe um, and nutty and uh, not particularly healthy for democracy. They're center stage there, and if you look at uh, the kinds of things that they do, there there uh, there are plenty of things that you just. Uh, they're they're tasteless and 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 generally harmful. I'm I'm not advocating banning them or anything like that, but it would be nice to see less of that. And certainly for people who are aiming to build a broad political movement to steer steer more clear of of things like that. But I I would with that criticism understood, I think that uh, those of us on on the left, and 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 just as part of a a broader, um, a a broader intuition, we should not celebrate when our opponents get sick with life threatening illness. Uh, we should not salivate at the idea of uh, of them dying or an outbreak uh, happening uh, among those people. They are uh, political opponents, and be, and even though they're not even uh, the loyal opposition, which in general is is what we should aim to have in this uh, in this country, friendly, civil, but vigorous uh, competition in the battle in the battlefield of ideas, and we uh, both sides should probably they uh, they should want to achieve their political ends, even though some of that probably should. Uh, should it should include an, an, a notion that uh, often policies are not particularly stable unless you get bi uh, bipartisan buy-in. Um, but some some policies sometimes you don't have that luxury and you just have to push for a victory sometimes. But but even with that, uh, and even with people who are not people who you would. Who you, who are really whose views are healthy uh, for a pluralist democracy? We shouldn't want them to get ill or die or anything like that. And I'm bothered to see that people celebrating the C CPAC Wuhan coronavirus um, spread. Uh, I'm I'm really bothered to see. A celebratory attitude among some people. I'm not claiming it's widespread, but it's clearly it's not negligible. I, I've seen it uh, enough of it to be pretty irritated uh, by it. Um. Anyhow, uh, also since my last uh, uh, since my last vlog, I um, I did my taxes, uh, which. Uh, it's 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 still a little bit weird how much effort that we have to put into doing that. A lot of other countries have that they don't have uh, tax pre preparation uh, companies lobbying to prevent 
uh, the government from basically making it easy for people to pay their taxes. It would be really nice to fix that someday. Um, but also, I, I check in generally on my finances every week or two and copy the amounts into a spreadsheet just so that I, I stay in the habit of, of keeping, keeping an eye on that on a regular basis. And it's interesting to see, interesting and maybe worrying for me personally to see the, the markets tumble so much um, over this. Uh, one hopes that they'll recover at least. I, I guess this is an area where I have to acknowledge that it's more of a personal interest than anything else. I, I won't be working forever. And although I don't know if, uh, if I really want to retire, it's possible that health issues might force me to at some point, or uh, maybe my current idea that I'll just keep on working when I hit retirement age, maybe I'll be wrong about that. Maybe I'll want to stop. Maybe uh, I'll want to uh, write a book or something like that. Um, I don't really know, but uh, it's personally worrying to me to, to see uh, with my um, retirement plans and, and my other investments, seeing them drop so sharply. Now, at the same time, uh, apart from, I, I guess there's a lot of people who do, uh, who rely on the stock market for, to, uh, to have a good retirement. And so we, we have to care uh, about them broadly. But at the same sense, I'm wary of seeing the endless growth of uh, the stock market as being necessarily a win for society outside of those retirement uh, concerns. Um, it f would feel like a big uh, commitment to, to state that endless um, economic growth is a positive thing. And so I don't. Um, my interest there is primarily personal with a little bit of that, but what about all the other people who are hoping to retire someday? A little bit of that bleeds into it. Um, I have some upcoming travel that I'm looking forward to. I almost never have taken vacations in my life. I'm going to Argentina. Uh, I'm going to Buenos Aires, and I think I mentioned this in my last uh, vlog, um, but the plan is, has come together. I figured out a lot of the places that I'd like to visit, and I'm, I'm looking forward to it, and I, I don't expect to turn into somebody who takes a lot of vacations, um, but nonetheless, I think it'll be a good life experience. Um, uh, uh, there's also Anaconda Con, which is a conda convention. Con uh, Anaconda is a packaging of the Python programming language uh, that's often used in data science, but it's also used in various other uh, other parts of tech. And so the, there's a conference that's going to be held in Austin that I'm looking forward to. Uh, both of those are provided that the uh, Wuhan coronavirus um, doesn't end up uh, effectively blocking those plans. And that's a concern. Um, it's possible that Anaconda Con will be canceled. It's possible that Buenos Aires will see it a big outbreak and I won't, and I'll decide that I don't feel safe traveling there. I'm hoping that that doesn't end up being the case, but it's a possibility. And uh, these are interesting times uh, to be living in. Also, since uh, since last month, the um, the the Democratic uh, the the race for uh, to get the Democratic um, candidacy for president has narrowed down effectively to two people, uh, to Biden and Sanders. And I strongly suspected that this would be the way it worked out. I think we weren't really sure, but we had some pretty good intuitions that Bloomberg wasn't going to be able to effectively leverage his, his platform into a viable candidacy. He started effectively too late and um, and that probably prevented uh, anything meaningful from happening there. Although he, he did raise some attention on some issues and uh, that's 
that's worthwhile. Sometimes it's been accidental, such as the role of non-competes on allegations of sexual misconduct inside his company. But nonetheless, uh, both when intended and not, I think that the candidacy has been positive uh, for the Democratic Party and probably for the United States. Um, I, I have uh, an intern that will be starting in a few months at work, and I'm really looking forward to that. Um, I've been trying to collect together uh, the things that I'd, I'd like to get across over the course of the internship. And that's, that's fun. I've always enjoyed teaching, or at least I've long enjoyed teaching. And a lot of the, the joy of it comes from figuring out what to talk about. What are the most important things to, to get across? And also just managing that uh, mentor-mentee uh, relationship, uh, which has only mildly started because uh, my intern, uh, she's busy with her undergrad. But uh, but it's it's starting, and that's that's good. Um, I guess the the other public thing that I wanted to to talk about is it's it's interesting to to see the topic of how presidents and presidential candidates should relate to the press um, come into view. Sanders has not been particularly well behaved with some news outlets recently. And I find this very worrying. And, but, uh, but using this as a bridge to talk about it in general, how it should work. I acknowledge that the the role of the press uh, relating to the president is to act as a foil. They're there to offer a critical response to what the uh, what the administration is doing. And, and they should. Uh, they, uh, the ability otherwise of a president to paint everything that he or she does is dangerously powerful. And the natural role of the press is to, to look at those claims, investigate them, and very often to say, nope, or how sure really are you about that? And that that means that there's a certain amount of adversary, uh, adversariality that enters into that relationship. And that's healthy. And it keeps uh, presidents honest, or at least it should. And, um, and uh, so that's, that's the way it should work. Uh, presidents, they, they, have to, uh, kind of, they have to grin and bear it with a, a lot of this criticism, a lot of the um, investigation. They have to deal with not, uh, their words not being taken on faith. Uh, they ideally should try to be an open book and try to uh, accept, uh, be, be humble enough to accept criticism without retaliation, without slamming the door, um, without their own misbehavior. And it tells us a, a lot about presidents when they fail badly in this, and not just presidents, also other elected officials. Um, and those who can still manage to try to generally be friendly despite this adversarial relationship, uh, it, it's, a, it's a good mark for their character. And this doesn't mean uh, accepting endless abuse, it doesn't mean always, uh, it doesn't mean that presidents should uh, or other political figures shouldn't uh, press back on narratives or definitions of terms or things like that that they don't agree with. Um, it should be treated as a kind of sparring, uh, knowing that press outlets still, they generally get the final cut in terms of uh, of how they arrange interview materials and, and things like that. But that's the way it should work. And uh, anybody running for, uh, for high office needs to, uh, needs to accept that and be used to it and realize that it's healthy for the nation. Um, and this is an area where I'm worried that Sanders is not 
uh, he's either not getting it or he's not exercising enough self-control um, when dealing with the, the natural frustrations that come about in that kind of relationship. And he should try to do better. Um, I mean, there's, there's a chance if he doesn't uh, get the Democratic nomination that it really won't matter too much anyhow because he's near the end of his career. He's very old. Um, it's unlikely that he'll still be uh, in, in good enough health to run for president again or any other high office. And in, in his current office as senator, uh, it's good to have these traits, but it's not as universal and it's probably not quite as important. But certainly as a presidential candidate, he should do better. Um, so just, just another few non-event related things, uh, or actually just one more. I, I, I wanted to briefly mention why there, there's, a, there's a particular gaming system that I've, I've never played, uh, a uh, pen and paper based role playing game called uh, Mage Ascension that I'm, I'm really into in the sense that I'm enjoying uh, buying and reading the source books to it and writing my own um, extensions uh, to that world. I, I, I've long enjoyed reading source books to role-playing games, largely because I, I often find the, the worlds that people build to be more interesting than the stories that they build in them. And there's a reason for this, and I, I, I think that more people should consider doing it for, uh, for this reason, and that's um, if, if you're interested in just having a lot of stories going through your own head, the more that you can be enriched by, by these systems of rules and worlds that other people have written, the, the better off you are in creating interesting stories that, that you, you can go through in your own head when you're dreaming, when you're daydreaming, things like that. And, uh, and maybe, like I've taken notes on some of my dreams. I've, uh, I've, uh, I have some docs on Google Drive and on Dropbox Paper and just on my various uh, hard drives on my computer, just full of notes about dreams that sometimes I, I just find it interesting to go back and read through them. Uh, it's, it, and I know that they've been enriched by, by reading these kinds of materials. I've gotten ideas to play with and I just, I think that's pretty cool. And the, the thing I particularly like about Mage Ascension is not, um, it's not so much that the main storyline that they created in the, uh, in the world in their, they have this, uh, they have one imaginary, f faction of nine different types of uh, wizards and they're going against uh, I think uh, five uh, five different types of um, secret uh, of other secret societies that are kind of sort of wizards but kind of sort of not the the premise of, of the mage ascension world is that uh, the universe is kind of mutable and that science is just another kind of magic uh, that uh, that has been regularized by this process uh, called uh, consensus, where the masses, when they begin to believe in a certain way about how the universe works, the universe actually begins to work that way. And so these five, se uh, five secret societies are called the technocracy, and they're uh, or the technocratic union and they're kind of they're intended in the setting to be semi villainous uh, but I I guess I like the idea of scientist heroes uh, and uh, and so I guess uh, I, I in particular like the the faction of the the void engineers in in that setting, they're they're kind of adventurers that mostly they, they don't get super involved in controlling the world like the other four factions in the technocratic union do. They're mainly interested in exploring space and exploring strange places in the world. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I just I'm finding it it to be good fantasy, and uh, I'm enjoying it 
maybe if you're into reading uh, reading that kind of thing, uh, then you might enjoy it too. Um, I don't think I, I doubt that too many people are running campaigns of this uh, across the country anymore. It's fairly old and due to a bit of a mess with the publisher and a, another company that acquired uh, them. Uh, a lot of the writing staff for this uh, world of fiction ha has been uh, uh, dismissed, but there's there's no particular reason that uh, that that needs to be a minus. And sometimes it's a little bit easier because you find um, that, like just just like I, I've probably talked about with Doctor Who. Um, I'm an old Whovian and that I consider the seventh doctor to still be the current doctor and everything beyond that to be uh, a non-canon and s as part of a remake series. And it's still annoying that a, a lot of new people are coming to uh, Doctor Who as a world of fiction, but they're doing it in a way that f that's focused around what I consider to be a non-canon extension. Uh, of uh, of the series, and so maybe it's kind of nice that there's less that I need to worry about with works that are more or less closed uh, worlds at this point. N uh, not a lot of people are still writing content for them. Uh, now, admittedly, in uh, in the Mage Ascension world, which is actually called Old World of Darkness, um, uh, because it's it's more than just the particular focus of Mage Ascension, but um, but in that world, uh, there was a final ex uh, extension to the series that I really didn't like. Uh, it tried to modernize a lot of the, the way that the world works, and it injected uh, things in, uh, into that world that I thought were negative additions. But it's still more or less, I think that was probably mostly the end of that storyline. And so there's not uh, not as much to... There aren't a whole lot of new people coming in who are seeing a continual stream of new things that I think probably shouldn't be considered part of that story. I would just uh, advise people to largely ignore the last uh, set of works in, in that world. Anyhow, um, over the last month, uh, I went to a number of events that I really enjoyed. I saw um, Dara O'Brien who's probably my favorite comic uh, at this point, a uh, stand-up comic. Um, and he also uh, runs a TV show called Mock the Week um, in, in the UK. I saw him live, and uh, that was a treat since I've, uh, I had never seen him live before. And it was fantastic. Uh, I sat fairly near the front, and uh, he, he does a lot of interaction with the audience that's direct and improvised and a lot of fun. Um, I, I went to a patron's pre uh, preview at the American Museum of Natural History on the nature of color. And it's all about color uh, perception. And I thought that was uh, pretty great. They've been doing a lot of, uh, they've been doing a good job with a lot of their recent uh, seasonal exhibits. And so uh, with this one, I got uh, some, uh, some great photos. Uh, they, um, they've just a lot of the recent exhibits have had a lot of visual appeal, and certainly with the nature of color, it's one that naturally they'd they'd want to. But I, I got some really great photos. It, it was just, it was, uh, it it's also neat just to be at the museum when it's full of other people who have decided to offer a lot of support to the museum and who are interested in science communication and talking about ideas. Um, I went to a Yucho Wang con uh, concert, uh, which was fun. I wasn't particularly aware of her as a musician, but I uh, I got the tickets uh, for free um, due to a, a friend deciding that they wanted nicer tickets than the, uh, the ones that they initially bought. And uh, so the ones that uh, the ones that I got, they were way way up in the balcony, uh, and so it, it felt like I was a very large bird on a very thin branch. I got a little bit of uh, acrophobia uh, being up there, but uh, eventually I chilled out. And, and the music, uh, she, uh, she did a, a, a wide smattering of classical music uh, pieces. 
um, there was there was a piece that really sounded like it was Debussy. It wasn't, but it was somebody who sounded a lot like Debussy. Um, and uh, yeah, th there was a lot to like. Um, went to an Intelligence Squared debate on uh, Israel, and this was a fairly spicy debate. Um, naturally, like th that's it's kind of it's a, one of those hot button topics in American politics uh, where it's one of those things that very often these things end friendships and um, for this reason I, I didn't try and get somebody from work to go with me ordinarily I do but uh, this just I, I I worry with topics that are sufficiently spicy that sometimes they can make it hard for people to uh, to work with each other um, uh, if they end up disagreeing enough on the topic uh, but nonetheless the debate was good um, there were some people who kind of in the audience who came pretty close to misbehaving badly and uh, that was weird to see because ordinarily intelligence squared debates have been quite good about not getting unruly uh, but the um, the topic of the the debate, as phrased, was on the proposal: anti-Zionism is the new anti-Semitism. And I entered the debate knowing that I pretty firmly believe that the best answer to that is no. And I left the debate uh, also believing. Uh, I mean, also with that firm uh, belief. But I, I heard some interesting arguments. One of the debaters was a, uh, uh, is a former member of the Knesset, um, the Israeli parliament. And um, like it, it, was, it was good to hear people passionately talk on both sides about why they believed what they did. And even though it didn't move me very much, it, uh, it, it's good to, to build empathy for differences in perspectives by by hearing this kind of impassioned debate and because I'm a member of Intelligence Squared I got to go to a post-debate reception where I um, asked the question of the member of the Knesset who was arguing yes um, I got to ask should those of us who are broadly opposed to ethno states uh, stop uh, that opposition and the answer was actually a, a no it was mostly the uh, I asked it to the um, I asked it to her and and she said no but don't expect Israel to be the first to dismantle uh, its uh, ethno state status and I I can understand that perspective uh, but she followed up on it with um, with the statement uh, which is kind of true but mostly not that many countries across the world, um, many of them have a certain amount of preference in terms of ethnicity and culture. And she, she brought up the example of a lot of European nations having an official state church. To me, this is a, it's, it's a false equivalence in that the degree to which that is favoritism uh, is incredibly small compared to things like the law of return which is a, a permanent uh, you can move here and get citizenship or you can't uh, type of gatekeeping uh, like if I were to move to a European nation with a with a state church generally I would be able to d decide when paying my taxes whether any of those taxes go to that church or not but in either case, it wouldn't uh, wouldn't impact my ability to immigrate, whether I uh, whether I'm an, a member of that religion or not. Um, so I, I don't think that the the amount of demographic uh, I don't think that a demographic preference, a strong demographic preference, it I don't think it can really compare to that kind of uh, we have a state church and you don't really have to do anything with it if you don't want to kind of thing. So it felt like a lazy answer uh, to me. Um, what I, if I'd been willing to be a lot more spicy, then I might have asked 
would you feel safer in an ethno state of an of another people or in a civil state uh and i i realize that that as a question that that's a it's a it's a much more leading question rather than a i want to hear what you think but rather i would like to try and make a point with a question kind of thing so maybe in terms of let's have an open exploration of ideas it's not as good but in terms of it might actually still be a good question in the debate perspective in general it, it probably it mostly just depends on how you think about these things um Finally, uh, I went to a very small non-traditional play called The Imbible, which was a history of alcohol and civilization set as a small musical. And it was held in a in a bar in a larger theater space. And there were about 20 of us um, that uh, that were able to fit into uh, into there. And there were four performers and it was a little bit acapella, a little bit um, just very small scale theater it was fun um it was i'm not sure really what to think about that kind of theater experience uh just it was different enough as to be probably the the weirdest theater experience that i've ever um that i've ever attended but i think i'm glad that i went that time uh, they they have a they have another show coming up which is meant as a kind of sequel and I'm not sure if I'm going to want to go to that or not. I might, um, it, but just in general I'm trying to broaden the the experiences that I have in my life as I realize that uh, a it would be good to go to things where I might meet people and form a circle of friends or find a significant other, but also uh i just i don't want to get too caught in my ways and have uh an excessively regular life uh where each week is like the last week and maybe i'm maybe i'm just overly worried about this because when i look back over my calendar i see that i i usually do go to at least one or two events every week and they're pretty different um but it's something that i'm frequently worried about I guess just the idea of ossifying as a person, it is deeply worrisome uh, to me. And I, I I would rather err on the side of, I mean, it's not even really erring, but I, I would rather lean in the direction of going overboard in terms of the, the variety I need than to become too static in terms of what I do. Anyhow, that's that's what's been up. Um, again, I'm uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. If people uh, have questions or things they want to hear my views on, uh, you can leave something in the comments, and uh, I will uh, try to I'll try to uh, either cover it in in the next month's uh, vlog, or I could potentially, if the topic isn't interesting enough do a video particularly on that. I'm theoretically maybe interested in doing more of these, but I would need to make sure that I have something interesting to talk about. Right now, uh, generally for a few days uh, before uh, before I do uh, one of these, even before I started doing the monthly, which is still a pretty new thing, um, I, I just have a word processing doc and I just jot down some topics not really what I'm going to say about them because I can do that off the top of my head but I I want to at least make sure that I uh, I know that what I want to cover and that I have enough to cover that it feels like it's worth um, worth doing this uh, well I'll be doing another one of these uh, in April Bye-bye.